We are all evolutionary success stories, the Darwinian end product of the survival and reproduction of every single one of our direct ancestors, all the way back to the origin of life three and a half billion years ago. Three and a half billion years has ultimately shaped us into the strange hairless apes that are able to listen to an audio recording, to process a particular pattern of sound waves, to extract meaning from those sound waves, and from that meaning generate sophisticated ideas and concepts like evolution, entropy, and money. Evolution, in many ways, has given us the neural real estate to generate stories and music, to create empires and capitalism, the internet and the atomic bomb. It's allowed our species to transcend nature and to submit it to our will, culminating in what geologists call the Anthropocene Epoch, this period of geological time where humans have been active agents in determining the planet's climate and ecosystems. More generally though, um, evolution has acted as this blind watchmaker, as Richard Dawkins would put it, creating all sorts of complex morphology in nature, relentlessly tinkering and altering with life, frugally selecting for organisms best adapted to their environmental niche, those who are most resilient and able to harness the entropy of the universe to create order, structure and organisation in response to the entropic pull of the universe into increasing disorder. How life engages with and adapts to the stringent constraints of nature is the very essence of this scientific concept we call evolution. This principle which explains the profound plurality of life which spans our planet. Now, to understand evolution, which is critical for any attempt to understand ourselves and what sort of species we are, we need to have a notion of variation, inheritance and selection, these three ideas which deeply underpin the function of evolution in producing diverse forms of life. Now, variation, quite simply, is the variety or the range of ways a particular trait can manifest in a population, something like extroversion, for example will vary in a population, typically in a bell curve-like fashion, with most people clustering around the average and fewer people as you venture to the extremes of extroversion, as you uh, find the people who are highly extroverted or highly introverted, they're going to be far fewer, fewer of those sorts of people compared to the average or the mean. When we think about inheritance, now this idea is, is simply the idea that certain traits can be passed on to the next generation, that the traits in question have a degree of heredity and therefore can be transferred to offspring. If you break your leg, for example, at some point during your lifetime, you, you shouldn't have to worry about your future child emerging from a womb with mangled lower limbs, because fortunately a broken leg isn't a heritable trait, whereas something like um, hair colour or height, however, is considered to be considerably heritable and therefore can be passed on. Now, this variation and this inheritance creates a foundation for selection, the, which you can think of as the constraints of the environment to exert an influence on the shaping of life. Now, selection, it comes into play when we consider which traits in the population are most conducive for survival and reproduction. Traits which improve evolutionary fitness, which enhance survival and reproduction, are the ones which are most likely to be passed on to the next generation. And selection, in many ways, it concerns the relationship between a trait and its downstream effects on evolutionary fitness. A trait which is well adapted to an environmental niche is one which optimizes or in some times satisfies its evolutionary fitness within a given context. And hence, that context or that environment is said to select for organisms with that particular trait. So, okay, now that I've got that dense evolutionary biology out of the way, let's move on to the more, more personal stuff, the more the topics of evolution which appeal to us, who we are. So let's think about this. What, what was the environmental niche of human beings? What selective pressures dictated our evolution into the, the beings we are today? And 
To consider such a question, it's important to point out that over millions of years of mammalian and hominid evolution, we have faced recurrent adaptive problems. Our ancestors, they engage with a, a hostile environment with a constant risk of predation, disease and parasites. Survival necessitated the ability to hunt and forage for fruits and vegetables and fish and meat. And we can expect to see various adaptations related to all these activities as evolution selected for individuals best able to meet those specific environmental demands. Now, elements of this adaptation is most obvious in our universal food preferences. We have this, we have evolved really this insatiable taste for sugars and fats since they provide a rich source of energy which would have been you know, highly advantageous within a, a food environment of great caloric scarcity which defined our ancestral environment. Now this innate preference is benevolently monetized by the modern food industry who carefully engineer our food with hidden sugars in order to make it as palatable as possible for our hunter-gatherer taste buds. Taste buds which simply have not had enough time to adapt from our ancestral environment of scarcity to the caloric abundance we can thank McDonald's and Pizza Hut for today. As well as this, the domain of natural selection can enable us to understand how the constant predatory pressure from snakes may have contributed to the evolution of our visual system. The predatory pressure from snakes having the effect of selecting for individuals with more acute vision who can spot and recognize snakes, improving their survival chances and transferring these skills to their offspring. And given that snakes were often a recurrent threat throughout our ancestral past, it's conceivable that we may have evolved adaptations to manage this unique kind of threat which would have been pervasive throughout our evolution history. And it does certainly seem as though we are biologically predisposed to be vigilant of snake-like objects, with snake phobia being one of the most prevalent phobias amongst the general population, much more prevalent than fears of guns or cars, which arguably pose a significantly greater threat in our modern environment. Though, of course, these inventions are far too recent for us to have developed unique adaptations. Likewise, the proliferation of easy calories from Big Macs and McFlurries are too recent a change for modern humans who have developed an adaptive response. Our metabolically efficient hunter-gatherer bodies are simply ill-suited to an environment of caloric abundance. And really, this ties into the concept of what we call evolutionary mismatch theory. This idea that traits which were adaptive in one context can become very maladaptive when placed in a different context. Now, in the same way that our ancestors had to manage adaptive problems related to its natural environment, archaic humans also face recurrent problems in the social domain. Interacting with other hominids created all sorts of issues with regards to how to form coalitions, negotiate exchanges and divide up resources and having to adapt to these novel social problems. It perhaps created our moralistic impulses for concepts like equity and fairness and a desire to punish people we deem cheaters or free riders. This evolved moral psychology likely enabled us to cooperate more effectively as groups and to form a cohesive social tribe. You know, when we think about it, this visceral contempt many of us have towards liars, cheats and deceivers which many of us intuitively have is perhaps a major component of this evolved social map we use to navigate the social domain, this map which steers us away from those we perceive as exploitative and towards those we deem as attractive or potentially cooperative. Our ancestors who were most attuned to social cues, cues which could indicate other people's intentions and goals were best equipped to navigate the ancestral social world in an effective manner. And it's pretty evident to me at least that the social world must have had a profound evolutionary impact on the shaping of our species and we can see elements of this in our physical design, the white sclera 
of our eyes, which lies around our pupils, is clearly designed to advertise the direction of our attention or gaze to those around us. It's almost instinctual, this tendency we have to follow someone's gaze if their eye suddenly darts elsewhere in the, in the, in the room. Other primates, they don't share this feature with us. They have pigmented scleras, which obviously better conceals what they're looking at. But this comes at the expense of their capacity for cooperation, which our species can, for better or worse, enjoy. Likewise, the highly sophisticated neural innovation of our facial muscles as well could be evidence of this evolution for sociality. You know, such innovation, it gives our species the capacity for a great array of facial expressions, expressions which, as we know, can be used to signal emotional states to other people, states of fear, surprise and anger, for example. And we also know from brain imaging studies that humans have a unique brain region called the fusiform face area, an area that is strictly attuned to the perception of faces and all the important information that it can contain. Like I said before, crucial to understanding um, us, our species, is recognising that our hominid ancestors were selected by not just their natural environment, the pathogens, the parasites, the predators that pose a constant threat, but also by their social environment. Having to navigate this social terrain which is filled by apes with all kinds of unknown thoughts, goals and intentions creates the environment for all sorts of adaptations to form as a result. For instance, we've, we've faced recurrent problems with regards to the topics, the challenges of mate selection and parenting. Our ancestors, they, they faced the momentous challenge of choosing a mate for the best possible reproductive success. This task of selecting who to recombine your genes with is, is one that faced every sexually reproducing animal since sex evolved approximately one or two billion years ago. And this choice of who to construct your genetic vessel with, should we say, carries clear ramifications for the continuity of your own genes and thus is of the utmost evolutionary significance. This mateship challenge, this mateship game, it, it required participants to, you know, to engage in all sorts of behaviours, to compete with members of the same sex for sexual access, to signal their best qualities to the rest of the tribe, to engage in all sorts of mate acquisition and retention behaviours. And when you think about it, we are the direct descendants of apes who managed to play this mateship game successfully, generation after generation. Thousands, really, of iterated human mateships has ultimately resulted in us, the apes who inhabit the world today. And when one considers the probabilities involved in the successful survival and reproduction of every single one of our direct female ancestors, it's easy to become simply astonished at how well, we are even here. Now, the fact that we are here it can't be some kind of fluke. Our behaviour has to have been pruned towards adaptive ends, otherwise we wouldn't have survived. And such behaviours, they can seem a mystery without an understanding of the evolutionary coding and the logic that lurks underneath. You know, we can often provide an assortment of reasons for explaining why we do the things we do, why we have particular goals, passions and desires. Consciousness, it it allows us a degree of insight into what features we might find attractive in a potential partner, say kindness, generosity, good health, etc. And it often seems obvious to us why we would find such traits attractive. Of course the features of kindness and generosity are going to be more conducive for a healthy relationship than meanness and stinginess. A partner who is kind to you and who bestows you with their energy, time and resources clearly values you more than an extractive partner. Now, whilst these preferences may seem obvious, it can be insightful to reflect on the evolutionary underpinnings since it helps us to understand where these preferences emerge from. It helps address the why question underlying such phenomena. Now, clearly 
most of us, we want to cultivate relationships that are ultimately beneficial, useful and positive for some, not relationships that bring out the worst in us, that drain us of our cognitive energy and turn us hollow and bitter. As social mammals, you could argue that we have this, we have this drive towards forming positive sum relationships, given their obvious benefit. Our ancestors who value traits such as kindness and reciprocity in social relationships were better equipped to form stronger bonds and more effective social coalitions than those that didn't. And these stronger bonds and social supports likely provided a litany of reproductive and survival payoffs. Hence, it paid off evolutionary speaking for humans to be attentive to such cues of prosociality, such as kindness and reciprocity. Likewise, stronger romantic bonds, which are built upon kindness, reciprocity and trust, they provide the bedrock of a healthy environment for raising offspring. Now, guiding a human being through the many developmental stages of life is a momentously costly endeavour, which demands a substantial amount of parental care, obviously. Now, it goes without saying that the more prosocial and altruistic relationships are probably better disposed to meeting these harsh energy demands of child rearing, which is perhaps why evolution has selected for individuals who were most attentive to cues of a prosocial partner, cues like kindness, reciprocity, etc., which could provide some insight into why exactly we find these traits, you know, so attractive. Now, knowing what qualities to look for when forming social relationships, whether, whether sexual or platonic, it can better equip you to cultivate those connections that grow rather than hinder you. Let's now like zone in on our sexual behaviours, this vast realm of adaptations which enabled the reproduction of our ancestors. Now, I want us to think about this question, these questions of what are those adaptations? What role has sex and mating played in the shaping of our cognition, desires and beliefs? What are the, the components of human attractiveness? Now, all these questions, they, they probe into this deeply fascinating aspect of our human nature, why we are, the way we are, what sort of species are we? And now, I understand that such probing can seem unsettling to some as a scientific enterprise. Now, shining a mirror on ourselves, it reveals everything, warts and all. And human nature, this innate structure, it, it, can, it provides us really with a wide range of proclivities. Proclivities towards the morally good and the morally repugnant. And really, in order to understand ourselves, it's important not to impair our judgment of any preconceived notions of humanity. You know, one should not cloud their lens through which to observe human behaviour because they're scared of what they might see. It doesn't change reality or really progress us towards a better epistemology. So really, let's try and be... So let us really aspire to be neutral observers of this human mateship dance. Now, first and foremost, we need to understand the concept of sexual selection, this idea that was first generated by Darwin in 1871. S put it simply, sexual selection simply concerns the unique selective pressures that accompany mate choice and competition. It's this mode of natural selection in which members of one biological sex choose mates of the other sex to mate with and compete with members of the same sex for access to members of the opposite sex. Now, the peacock's iridescent plumage, which by the metric of natural selection is a needless handicap, is a powerful image of sexual selection's ability to create all sorts of beautiful and interesting morphology in nature. Now, this peacock's tail is a mystery when viewing adaptation through the lens of quote-unquote survival of the fittest. It is long, it is cumbersome, and it clearly attracts predators. Natural selection surely should have culled this extravagant surplus in favour of more conservative and discreet peacock tail designs. Now, this might have been true in a world devoid of sexual selection, 
a world whereby adaptation was solely a function of what optimizes survivability. Though of course reproduction is just as critical for the evolutionary fitness of an organism as, as well as its survival features. The march of evolution really only considers the genes which are able to replicate themselves into the next generation. Survival related adaptations to the environment are only selected for if they translate into differential reproductive rates between organisms with and without this particular adaptation. Reproduction really is the it's the ultimate final hurdle for continuing one's genes into the future. And really over millions of years of evolutionary fine tuning, genes which were best adapted to reproducing themselves generation after generation are the ones which have cemented themselves into our genotype after three and a half billion years. So why on earth does nature produce the peacock's plumage? Why is the extravagance of this ornament an essential metric that female peacocks use to screen potential mates? What information could the vibrancy of a male's peacock be possibly conveying to females? It surely must be signaling something relevant for it to be a criterion of female choice. And sure enough, the peacock's tail is conveying critical information, information regarding the biological fitness and the health of the male peacock. This is because it is only the fittest and the healthiest peacocks who are able to survive and reproduce despite having this costly and cumbersome tail. Less fit males would, would be more disadvantaged with the challenge of surviving with such a conspicuous ornament and hence we can understand the tail to be an honest signal of evolutionary fitness. It's, it's essentially conveying the message of, hey my genes are so good I'm able to survive with this big bushy and useless tail please let me impregnate you. And sure enough, female cog peacocks who have evolved to attend and seek out cues of good genes will filter uh, males based upon their tails since it acts as a, a costly signal of genetic health. Now, humans, unlike peacocks, they do not have long, fluffy tails to display their genetic fitness. Instead, there are a variety of other characteristics which cross-culturally have been shown to contribute to our humanly notions of physical attractiveness. Now, facial symmetry, for one, is a factor which tends to contribute to our assessments of physical attractiveness. The more symmetrical a face is, the more attractive one tends to find it. So, this raises the question of, well, what's so significant about symmetry? Now, again, you know, facial symmetry is a good si signal of physical health and, as well, a low mutation load. Faces, if you, if you pay attention, are immensely complex configurations. If you alter the orientation of an eye or a mouth just slightly, things will start to look off very quickly. So, really, to create a perfectly orderly face is no picnic and any sort of developmental stressor can create asymmetry very easily. So again we can understand that the symmetry of the face acts as a form of signal, a signal which is, we have been evolutionarily attuned to intuitively like in the same way we have been tuned to like sugar and fat. You're not thinking of all the saturated fats and sugars tickling your dopamine reward pathways as you choose to devour Cadbury's Easter egg. And in the same ways, we aren't, most of us aren't at least consciously processing the remarkable symmetry of a person's face when we deem them attractive. These evolutionary influences typically operate implicitly beneath our level of conscious perception. But even though we aren't explicitly aware of such phenomena, this doesn't mean that they aren't shaping and moulding our behaviour in substantial ways. So, a lot of sexual selection involves the selection of mates according to particular cues and signals, signals of evolutionary fitness, how healthy and fertile you are, how amazing your genes are, etc, etc. And of course, these signals are going to vary depending on what species we are talking about. Now, the fascinating thing about humans, I think, is that we have such a diverse range of signals, signals that are far more elaborate and complex when compared to the more primitive signal of, oh, I guess, ooga booga, I'm the biggest, strongest ape, that might characterize the mating repertoire of our primate cousins. Our signals, they can range from 
the clothes we wear, the, the things we say, the music we listen to, the, the hobbies we engage with. Often we want to signal particular elements of our personality to other people. One person might choose to wear an artsy t-shirt to signal that they're high in openness. Another person might choose to wear a MAGA hat to send a different sort of social signal, a signal of disagreeableness or political conservatism. These signal dynamics are the currency of how we engage with the social world. They are the, the images and the displays that we show to others around us, often with the explicit or the implicit intention to send a message, to share some kind of information about ourselves. You could probably think of our social media profiles as the specific cultivation of social signals, an online social persona that is designed to signal specific traits about ourselves, traits of our intelligence, creativity, agreeableness, or whatever. Now, this signaling theory, it, it pierces deeply into how humans interact socially and sexually. And as we know from the peacock's tail, this notion of signaling certain traits isn't exclusive to human beings and it can be seen throughout nature. So I think I will conclude here and I'll pick up next time with a more comprehensive investigation into human mating dynamics. Now that we have some evolutionary intuitions, these are notions of adaptation, fitness and signals, we'll be in a good position to grapple with the science of our sexuality next time. We'll be ready to peel back the outer layer of the socio-sexual dynamics we observe in the modern environment to see the mechanisms at play which bias and mould our sexual behaviour and cognition. Until next time, thank you for listening.